Hi, I'm Kalila Reynolds and welcome to Taking Stock. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. But before we get started, head over to takingstock-ja.com to subscribe to our newsletter. You can click the link up here or in the description box below. Also, make sure you watch this video to the end because our website launch date is finally coming up. We've got tons of giveaways planned, new exclusive merch and lots more. Now, come on, let's get this money. First up, what's up with the real estate market? Most people were expecting a real estate crash due to the pandemic, but both the residential and commercial prices have held steady. And how are investors in the short-term rental space doing now with the collapse of tourism? We'll discuss with second vice president of the Realtors Association of Jamaica, Roger Allen, and Airbnb owner in Ocho Rios and member of the Jamaica Home Shares Association, Shara Nepal. And later, the analysts swain on the latest market developments. Nutswood Express has taken a hard hit with a $25 million loss for the quarter ending August as the transportation industry suffers. However, profit is up over Caribbean Cream, up $51 million for the six months ended August 31, and the IMF has revised its global outlook. We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. The International Monetary Fund IMF estimates that the global economy will now shrink 4.4% this year. The outlook represents an upgrade of 0.8 percentage points on the previous forecast in June. While the new figure would still constitute the worst annual plunge since the Great Depression of the 1930s, the IMF attributes the slightly less dire forecast to faster-than-expected rebounds in some countries such as China and rescue aid enacted by the U.S. and other industrial countries. The IMF predicts a rebound to global growth of 5.2% next year, 0.2 percentage point lower than in its June forecast. The cost of goods and services remained flat for September, according to the Statistical Institute of Jamaica, which reports that the inflation rate for the month was 0.2%. Statin says there was insignificant growth in the heaviest weighted division, food and non-alcoholic beverages. Higher tuition fees for the new school year, however, saw the education division jumping by 22%. The overall movement of September's inflation rate was slowed by a 21% fall in water and sewage rates, which contributed to a 2.2% decline in the housing, water, electricity, gas and other fuels division. Within this division, electricity rates went up by 1.9%. Meanwhile, the transport division also declined by 0.1% as a result of lower petrol costs. Audrey Tugwell Henry will assume the role of President and CEO of Scotiabank Jamaica on January 1, 2021, to become the second woman to head the country's second most powerful bank in more than a century of operation. She replaces David Noel, who will return to Canada to take on the role as head of the bank's Atlantic region. Noel had replaced the first female head of Scotia Group Jamaica, Jacqueline Sharp, back in November 2017. Tugwell Henry rejoined the Scotia Group in 2017 as executive vice president of retail banking Caribbean, North and Central. Meanwhile, Scotia Bank has reached a deal to sell its operations in Antigua and Barbuda to a local bank, Eastern Caribbean Amalgamated Bank. The agreement ended a standoff with the Antigua and Barbuda government, which insisted that a local entity be given priority in the sale. Scotia Bank Bank has two branches and fewer than 75 staff on the island. The terms of the deal is subject to regulatory approvals and closing conditions. The market value of Barita Investments hit $100 billion for the first time last week and joined three other stocks in the club. Barita closed at $92.20 on Wednesday, valuing the company at just over $100 billion. The company closed trading last week at $92.10. The other three companies on the market in the $100 billion club are NCB Financial Group, Sagicor Group Jamaica, and Scotia Group Jamaica. Proven Investments has two deals in the pipeline that it plans to finance in part through its additional public offering APO. The APO was cancelled in June as a result of COVID-19 but now appears to be back on. The company is yet to finalize how big the APO will be, but in the March offer they were seeking to raise up to 75 million US dollars if upsized. 
Proven has, however, indicated that part of the APO proceeds will be used to take over 100% control of two medium-sized companies within the Caribbean. The Supreme Court will decide whether a key insurance company can hold a virtual annual general meeting AGM one day ahead of its convening. The meeting is scheduled for October 22. Chairman Don Webby thinks the October 21 hearing might be too close and might mean a postponement. However, he said it was the earliest date they could have gotten from the court. Key's AGM will be the first since Grace Kennedy's takeover of the General Insurance Company, which had fallen into trouble and needed a bailout. What's Hot was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. When we come back, we'll take a look at the real estate market. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agent, Insurance Made Easy, and Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Welcome back to Taking Stock. Historically, recessions have resulted in a crash in real estate prices, but in Jamaica and elsewhere, real estate has so far held its ground. Will prices fall or go up? And how has the rental market been holding up? Joining us now are second vice president of the Realtors Association of Jamaica, Roger Allen, and an Airbnb owner in Ocho Rios. She's also a member of the Jamaica Home Sharers Association, Shara Nepal. Hi, Shara. Hi, Roger. Good to have you on. Hi, Salila. Thanks, Thank sir. you for having me. This should be a good discussion because real estate has been a hot topic since COVID. Everybody wants to know what's going on with the real estate market. Shara, you're in Airbnb's home sharing. That's been hit. But somehow real estate has been resilient, Roger. What's going on with, with real estate prices right now? It's all about supply and demand. Um, we were actually a bit cautious in observing the COVID effects um, from, you know, we should say the onset was about March thereabouts. But what we noticed is that in June, July, um, developers were more than eager to get um, projects off the ground that were approved. You still had other developers that were actually looking for land opportunities um, to do more development. And one of the things we realized is that the demand was actually um, there. So the persons are looking for real estate, not only for residential you know, purposes for their home, but investment purposes as well. We noticed this in the corporate area and as well on the North Coast. For example, you look at St. James outside Montego Bay, Iron Shore, Coral Gardens, areas like that, and you've seen some premium development that have gotten off the ground. And you put it in context that this is the year the North Coast where has been hardened by the effects of COVID in terms mm -hmm. of single or dual income um, souls being adversely affected. But guess what? The demand is there. And we're talking two bedroom apartments that um, are being sold for 500,000, 500, 600,000, uh, even luxurious apartments. And you realize that, yes, we have uh, challenges of COVID and you know, the economy is affected, but there is still money in circulation for want of a better word. So prices have not been impacted at all? Prices, again, that's with supply and demand. One of the concerns that I have, and a number, let me not say the Realtors Association, but a number of the members have, it's really the price point of um, apartments, for example, in the corporate era. What we find is that the prices, um, there is, is a sort of leveling out. The, the demand is there. You have two bedrooms, um, two bedroom apartments that you 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 want one. You have to fetch, uh, it, it fetches in the ballpark of say thirty five million. And these are apartments where you're looking at a monthly maintenance of upwards of twenty five thousand per month. 
That's interesting. Shara, Roger spoke to the North Coast being among those where you know properties are still selling, still selling at a premium. You're in the Airbnb space. You're also with the Jamaica Home Sharers Association. What has been the experience of you guys who are, so you're on the receiving end. You would have purchased properties while Roger and his association's members would be selling properties. So just to add um, a little bit to what Roger is saying, I have homeowners um, calling me, asking me if they should be purchasing because, like he's saying, there's a lot of demand. And that's true because persons are calling me, asking me, should we purchase? Should we purchase this piece of land here or that property there? Because even though it's a pandemic and rentals have gone down naturally, as in with everybody in the tourism industry, uh, they're looking towards a boom happening, you know, once all of this is cleared out. So they're wondering if it's good to purchase properties for longer experience in a boom, which is what we're all expecting, seeing as how everybody is going to want to be coming out of being locked up. They're going to want to, you know, go out, have some fun, experience the sun, sun and sea. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're encouraging persons that, yeah, you can buy because even though the market is slow now and even though the demand has gone down in terms of tourists coming in and booking, we're expecting that it's going to pick up once all of this has, you know, been cleared up and where COVID is behind us. Mm, so that could be part of what's fueling the demand, especially there on the North Coast. You're in Ocho Rios, right, Shara? Yes, I am. Yeah. So, so Roger, how is this different, though? Why is it different than 2008, the Great Recession? We saw what happened as an, on, on real estate market as an impact of that. Prices plummeted. But this time around, that hasn't happened. Why? And I'm talking not just Jamaica, but the, the United States to other markets, the same has happened. Part of it, the Ponzi schemes had um, contributed negatively towards it because what you had in essence was a kind of artificial demand where you had inflated and unreal prices in terms of real estate. Um, you had, um, for example, let us just put in context, you had a property that was, say, $20 million. Um, the asking price was $20 million. When, when you look at it in the reality, the, the, the real market value of that property would be anywhere from 12 to 14 million. You had uh, some of that happen there. But what we find now is that, remember, we have had a bit of boom where um, construction was on a rise. And we're talking from late 2018, 2019. So money was in circulation. But one of the effects that I've had or experiences I've had from buyers without going political, some buyers, especially the more mature ones, thought that this would be another period of the mid-1970s, that era when you had the five flights a day where a person thought, ah, with the effects of COVID, um, I, I can't um, a property at me 20% below market value because of the effects of the pandemic. But um, what we are realizing is that the sellers are realizing that the demand, the, 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 the demand in terms of purchase or seek, buyer seeking properties is still up there. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's definitely on the rise. I mean, when I look at even in Jamaica, somebody asked me, the corporate era, um, Havendale, that side, to find them a $22 million property. And, you know, basically, I said that is a very optimistic, um, or should I say, that's a very optimistic demand. demand. And in terms well, of what would you get for $22 million in Havendale right now? Um, a, well, a studio? If you could go back 12 years, um, maybe that would work. But um, not in this day and age. In Havendale, no. they're actually seeking a three, four bedroom house that, you know, would be like a fixer up or original structure. For 22 million have, in Havendale, that's what they were seeking? They were seeking 22 to 24, they said maybe. So what would that price point get you there right now? That apartment? Would be, that would get you an apartment. That would get you a, 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 a one to two bedroom, something like a two bedroom bathroom. One of the modest ones, not one that is on the luxurious end, um, that would get you 24 million, 
to something, a, a modest two-bedroom, one bath. So, Shara, you're in short-term rentals, and I, I've been wondering, too, how since the demand hasn't gone anywhere and some of your members are actually seeking to buy right now, anticipating the boom, how have those who are in short-term rentals been able to survive this period not having any income coming in? Well, um, members have been getting creative. Uh, most persons have now switched over to semi-long-term to long-term rentals um, just to wait it out. Um, who, whoever is still doing short-term is open to price changes to match demand. Um, you know, that demand has gone down, so we have to drop our prices. We're doing, you know, promotions that appeal to Jamaicans, you know, so more, most Jamaicans are, are traveling more than tourists. So um, it's just basically what is, what, is in, what is happening in the market and just responding to it. But most persons have gone over into long-term rentals. Who haven't is just trying to catch the persons within Jamaica that is struggling. What types of leases are they offering? Like when you say long-term rentals, you're looking at a year plus? Six months to a year. And that's about how long they anticipate before the short-term rentals come back? Yes, everybody's anticipating that it will be about mid next year. Mm. Roger, you wanted to add something there? Yes, definitely. I just piggybacking on what Shara is saying. Um, we have mem the diaspora, and I'm particularly targeting the US especially, and um, England as well, the UK and a whole. There is renewed interest on acquiring property here. Um, a number of persons happily have remembered um, that Jamaica is where they're from. And I would say the interest that I am seeing here is phenomenal. I would use that word. And um, also remember that at the onset of the pandemic, you had where the hotels, the tourism virtually came to a grinding halt. So the short-term rentals for members of the diaspora and others coming into the country, um, short-term rentals, um, primarily the Airbnbs, were um, pretty much the order of the day because whereas yeah. a hotel would yeah. be closed, the short-term rentals offered an alternative. And also, just in speaking to three, three or so clients, which was reflective of others too, the, also the restrictions on going through a tour company to some of the attractions. Persons were more or less looking at other alternatives to say, why don't I get a short-term rental? Um, I will have enough resources, you know, having safe going to a hotel to rent a vehicle. And I can drive myself around especially those that are in the diaspora. And yes, you also have some of the visitors that have been so adventurous. You see, I was privy to Airbnb statistics for last year, and um, I, it was shared with the Ministry of Tourism. We dealt with uh, McGill University, who is um, the, reg regarded as the foremost um, authority on short-term rentals. We actually had them at our conference in a presentation. And what we found out is that in terms of Airbnb for Jamaica last year, St. Anne was the number one parish mm -hmm. for Airbnbs. Oh, yeah. uh, the number two was St. James. And when we broke down St. Anne, guess where the Airbnbs were coming from? Richmond. And, mm -hmm. and so went back there again and said, ah, let me see how Richmond is doing. Very popular now, location, yes. Lo and behold, I'm talking about May, June. Um, you know, and I spoke to some other persons because you have a number of housekeepers there that are the caretakers. And some of them are responsible for three units because the owners, a number of them are overseas. A few of them are here. And they're saying, sir, let us put it this way. God is good. We can't complain. And um, you, you, you realize that was the order of the day. Staycations from locals, but yeah. also some of the members of the diaspora coming in, um, not being able to access the hotels. And some of the visitors too. Um, let me say this to you. The, 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 the challenges of 
governments managing COVID elsewhere in the world has created an opportunity for us. Because if I tell you um, persons who have vi been visiting from North America, you know, the US in particular, and also Europe, and they are not exactly as they used to be coming for 10, you know, say 10 days to two weeks, a number of them because of the affordability of short-term rentals. They are staying like a month um, on that um, average, a month or a little more than a month, actually, in terms of the whole thing with quarantine and just, you know, taking the time to enjoy another country, you know, whilst you have challenges where you're currently residing, be it the U.S., be it the U.K. or elsewhere in the world. Shara, you're on that side of the island, so you're in Ochi. Richmond is not, not far from there. Uh, have your members been trying to attract the local crowd more? Yes, yes, Kalilo. Um, members and myself, because I have a few properties here in Richmond as well as in Drapsal, which is not far from there. Um, we have been trying to attract the locals, you know, a little bit more, seen as though they're trying to come down on the North Coast, like I said, to get out of the city and to, you know, enjoy the, the atmosphere. But I just wanted to add something to what Mr. Allen said. Um, he, he basically spoke a few of my points. Persons from overseas, not just the Jamaican diaspora, but persons from Canada and the United Kingdom, when they book and they come here, even though the bookings are far and in between, they are actually booking for longer stays. And you'll hear, you know, the feedback from them. They want to stay here. Level one, they're trying to find properties to buy if, if they're Jamaican um, to come back home because they're watching a few of the things. Um, politics, for example, in U.S., persons are watching, you know, the, the government elections that they have coming. Right. The crisis there. So they want to have a plan in place so that in case something happened, they can come back home. And in that entire process, when they come here, they're booking longer stays so that they can wrap up whatever business that they have have here. Um, even though what he said, um, speak to the housekeepers, business is very slow, as with everywhere else. But these rentals, the longer stays, they're actually very good and they benefit us. Um, just to go back, you were saying that if we're attracting locals, we have most persons rent for say three nights minimum. We have had to go in and adjust um, minimum nights, prices, create packages for locals because that is the market that is really most active now. Um, we have been trying to accommodate locals. A weekend so stay, a one overnight. Industry. We can stay one overnight. Exactly. Yeah, just a little getaway for kind of a day thing. or two. Yeah. Before we go, though, Roger, what about commercial real estate? What has, what has been the impact on, on that sector of the market? Because we're hearing news where a lot of businesses have people working from home now. Small businesses are transitioning and saying, well, since you've been working from home and this has been working for us, why do we need an office space? So have you seen an impact on the commercial real estate market? Um, there is an impact somewhat. There is demand, actually. Let me use the corporate era where I have a bit of data on because that's where I'm based, even though I operate all over the island. What I've found is that uh, there is increased demand for commercial space. If you take stock of the construction, the development that has been happening in the corporate era, era over the past two years, most of it, I would say 80, 90 to 90 percent of it has been residential. Yeah. So it, it, it has created that lopsided effect where um, there is a bit of demand there. For example, somebody like a doctor, medical practitioner, there is no operate from home. There are uh, still a number of entities but still crave or require the office space. And again, part of the effect on that is that you have persons who for quite a while wanted to move away from renting space to acquiring space. And so there is the perception, there is the belief now that now is the time in the midst of COVID, maybe something that, has, that they've been looking at, let us say that um, they had to fork out 60, 70 million a year ago to acquire. 
I have had persons who are optimistic that maybe I can get it for um, low 50s or mid 50s to 60, that same property they were looking at, and other opportunities on a whole. I am now um, trying, fervently trying to find properties for four clients. And, uh, you know, the, the way how I've been. Been, been reminded, you know, please, you know, find something for me. And of course, you know, there are limitations with budget and otherwise. Make no mistake about it. There's a demand because these are the same persons that are saying whatever we have had in the past, whether it was, you, you know, certain periods, be it the 2008, 2009, that period, be it the mid 70s, are saying it will not last forever. And that is so true. So it's about position yourself now before prices go further, because make no mistake about it, when we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, in terms of COVID being lifted, you know, we have a vaccine and all of that. So you the expect prices are going to go up. you expect the prices to go up further. So you're not expecting prices to come down at all. Not now, for the single reason that there are a lot of buyers seeking property, mm. whether it's somewhere to live, whether it's for investment, or whether it's commercial real estate. So we're um, still in a seller's market. It is, yes, pretty much a seller's market. I've had persons, for example, saying to me, let's take a drive, which I'm in short order over um, to along the corridor from Harbour View to Port Antonio. I think we all know why. There's the industrial park um, there that is, uh, you know, that will be developed in um, St. Thomas. Uh, there's more to come there. But I hear that land all sell off already. I hear there's no land to get that side. No, the South Coast Highway is coming and that's all gone. I would say to persons, contact me because I, <laughs> I, I am in touch with <laughs> landowners there. And I'm talking um, that you have beachfront property and you have otherwise, I, I mean, right now there's one in particular, very good land. And you're talking close to 900 acres. And whether you want it completely. What kind of prices? What kind of prices? Uh huh. <laughs> Prices just below what you see at um, KMS and Bernard Lodge, interestingly. Which is what Prices range? Just, all right. You're seeing, for example, an acre in that is designated as um, commercial there. And um, the persons, you're looking at about 20, you're looking at 25, 30 mil. Um, the more favorable ones that is roadside, you're talking, um, you know, right along the high corridor there. You're easily looking at, um, depending where, 45 to 60 million per acre. Mm -hmm. These lands, um, less than a year ago, the ones that you're looking at, 45 to 60 million, they previously were somewhere in the region of um, 15, 25 million. Wow. And I'm talking six to nine months ago. We're going to see a boom that side of the island very soon for sure. Before we go, Shara, let me hear your last thoughts. We're still in a seller's market. And what are your, what's your outlook for the next six to 12 months? What I would like to say is that we can look at home sharing and short-term rental properties as the silver lining behind the COVID-19 dark clouds because if persons want to get away, have some good time, our properties by nature um, offer you know, seclusion, privacy, not being around as you know, many people as you would say that persons will be coming in contact with when they're in a bigger hotel, sorry. So um, we just want persons to see it like that. We're having a little bit of difficulty because even with the Visit Jamaica website, we're not listed on it as you know places where persons can stay, even though if we're along the resilience corridor, you know, you can come here, you can book and stay in an Airbnb property. So I think that is a reason that affects us in terms of getting international guests. But overall, we just have to wait it out and see where it goes from here. I'm expecting a boom, though, for sure. Optimism coming from both of you on the real estate market. Thanks for your perspectives. Thank you, Kalila. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you, for, Thank you for, having for having us. Me. All the best.
Stay tuned, we've got your market recap and the analysts are standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agent, Insurance Made Easy, and Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Time now for your market recap, brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange advanced to the combined index gaining less than 2%. 97 stocks traded across both the main and junior markets of the JSC for the week ending Friday, October 16, 2020. 41 advanced, 44 declined and 12 stayed the same. Nearly 127 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling nearly $2.6 billion. Trans-Jamaican highway traded the most, taking up nearly 29% of market volume. The stock gained $0.08 cents to open the week at $1.36. Epley Caribbean Property Fund SCC traded the second highest, with people buying and selling nearly 17 million shares in the company. Epley's stock lost $4 to open the week at $45.70. And Barita Investments rounded out the most traded, taking up 10% of market volume. The stock gained $12.14 to open the week at $92. Now let's see who had the biggest gains. ISP Finance Services jumped nearly 38% to close last week at $20.81. Nutsfell Express rose 20% to close last week at $6.77. And AMG Packaging and Paper Company shares rounded out the biggest gains to close the week at $1.86. On the losing side now, JMMB Group 7.25% VR Jamaican Dollar CR preference shares fell 18% to close last week at $1.21. Consolidated Bakeries Jamaica fell nearly 18% to end last week at $1.21 a share. MPC Carbon Clean Energy lost 17% down to $140. Market recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services. Welcome back to Taking Stock. I've got a team of analysts to examine the week in business. I'm joined by Senior Wealth Advisor at Ideal Portfolio Services, Auric Angus, and Research and Strategy Analyst at Sachicor Investments, Jody Ann Aris. Hey, Auric. Hey, Jody Ann. Welcome back. Hi, Karina. Thank you. Thanks. Always a pleasure. So let's start local and then go regional and international because a lot's going on on the global markets in addition to, to what's going on here locally. So we've seen some results this week. Knutsford Express is reporting numbers showing that you know, transportation is down and that's expected given what has happened with COVID. So Auric, what are the numbers telling us? Um, the numbers are very very heartbreaking about, um, I think, revenues had significantly declined for Knoxford Express around 62%, which is around 202 million. Obviously, that's because of the coronavirus pandemic, which limits the movement of their customers and the curfew that has been imposed on the island. On top of that, the company um, expenses, the operating expenses fell by approximately 45%, which is around 148 million. So all in all, it has, it has really hit them hard and the signs are showing now, and I'm not just singling out um, Knoxford Express here. This is an international um, it's on the transportation industry, both airspace and ground transportation, you know. So right now the company, they will have to try and find creative ways to, to boost their revenue streams. Uh, we can't say how long that will, that will take to come to fruition, um, but the fallout is very much expected um, from my standpoint. Yeah, and they would have been hit by tourism as well. Have they laid off? Have they had to lay off people? I have not heard anything about any layoff as yet. Well, it sounds like that might be coming if things don't pick up soon. Right. I see where they're yeah. saying that they're planning on using technology to, to boost their revenue stream, but that's as far as it goes. I wonder how, because technology can't can move people from point A to point B. So. <laughs> Customer. That, that's the organic stream of their revenue. Yeah, they have a very physical-based business. Yeah, right. Exactly. 
there might be uh, as well as they would have also benefited from events i mean i know when you have right. particular events they would have of course shuttle services it should have been a little bit of an optic and also that now is gone yeah um, this is one of their worst quarters um I, i'm not sure if it can get any worse than this but let's see yeah beam me away scotty <laughs> if, only, if only teleporting was real huh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's look at the manufacturing. No, before we go to manufacturing industry, Caribbean flavors and fragrances. Well, they are manufacturing as well, but they yes. recently did their stock split that became effective. Jordian, what impact has that had? Um, I think generally what you find with the junior market stock is they reach to a certain price and there's reduced trading just because of the price point and so a stock split normally helps um, in terms of getting, you know, more trading for a particular stock, particularly on the junior market. Um, I think one of the other things I noticed with Caribbean flavors and fragrances is what's really key for companies within a crisis such as this is to expand your services or to branch off into areas that you weren't before. So typically they would have made fragrances for home products so your lawn detergents and stuff like that they'd provide fragrances for as well as flavors for like cake and you know baking but they have since covid now in response to covid actually gone into hand sanitizers which really for them is a plus and is a positive and it's really what we want to see more of companies doing it's, they're moving to areas based on the demand and the uh, opportunities that possibly came with COVID-19 and that has really resulted in their performance. So you see for the quarter, it's actually up year on year for the second quarter. When you look at the six months this year versus six months last year, the profit has also been up. So what type of trading activity have we seen since the stock split? Auric, you want to take that one? It comes down to different perspectives. You have the investors who want to buy it before the, the split really occur. So um, there's increased activity right now as we speak. What about another MND company, Caribbean Cream, manufacturers of creamy ice cream? They posted results recently. What are the results showing us, Auric? Um, yeah, I actually do like this one. Um, Caribbean Cream has very good results. The, the revenue stream is very marginal, just 6% increase in revenue, which amounts to around 891 million versus 839 million when you compare it to the same period last year. But if you check the revenue growth over the last five years, you have seen that sustainable increase over time from our, between the range of 7 to 18% over the last um, half a decade. One of the biggest setbacks that the company had over that time period was their high administrative expenses, which they, they, they have been able to contain over the years um, to lower costs. So if you notice, with just 6% increase in revenue and the company has been able to deliver um, triple-digit profits. So for example, for the, in this recent report, the company has delivered a 110% increase in their profit margin for the six-month period and around 220% increase in the last quarter up to August 2020 this year. So those are very healthy numbers. Um, the demand for the product um, is still there. Obviously, the pande pandemic haven't hit them that much where sales is concerned. But the key factor was through their warehouse expansion that was completed some about a year ago, which had increased the company's um, capacity to produce. Um, to, to their clients as they, they expand throughout, other, uh, throughout the, the island. Um, all in all, it has been good for them, but the key driver was through their reduced um, cost to operate. Okay, let's look uh, globally now because the World Economic Outlook is out. The IMF and the World Bank had their meetings last week. So, jodi Ann, what is the economic outlook looking like now? What are the big boys saying about what's likely to happen? Well, what they're projecting is that for 2020, that global economy will contract by about 4.4%. I mean, and even though it's a contraction, there's still some positive coming out. I mean, what they're saying is that this is actually better than what they had initially forecasted in June. So initially in June, they thought that for 2020, we'd have had a bigger decline globally. But now they're saying it's at 4.4% decline really due to the fact that they're seeing quite a bit of pickup in the second quarter activities, as well as 
early indicators for third quarter for third quarter is very promising. What I found very interesting though was that when you compared, even though there's there's a projected increase for 2021, which is expected, seeing that you'd have very low activity in 2020. So to compare year on year and have an increase wouldn't have been so big. But when you look at 2022 and you look at there's actually an increase there, and when you compare 2021 to 2019 is actually an increase and so that is actually i didn't anticipate a return to pre-covid levels as quickly i mean i was thinking you'd probably see that in later in you know probably 2022 2023 but their projections are showing that there could be an uptick i mean in excess of pre-covid levels by 2021 um, when you drill down to the caribbean the expectation is that there's going to be a decline of 5.4% in the economies. And the thing with the Caribbean is that there, there's it's twofold because most of our territory is very dependent on tourism. And because the pickup in tourism is not going to happen as fast as if you compare it to like global, the, the more advanced economies, then there's still going to be a hang for us, even if you go into 2021. Um, an additional, the second thing for us is that we are still very at risk for weather-related shocks. So, I mean, if it is that we were to now get a hurricane on top of COVID, mm -hmm. then, you know, it would be a double whammy. It would be really, really tough for an economy to struggle with those two big shocks in any one year. And so that is an extra risk that is really facing for the Caribbean. However, the, the really the stock performer that is expected to come out of the Caribbean is Guyana. And they are looking that Guyana for 2020 could grow by about 26%. Um, it, I mean, it may sound big, but it is actually coming down from initial projections. So when they had done the assessment at the end of last year, looking into 2020, before we knew anything about COVID, we were actually expecting that Ghana would probably have growth at about 80%, in excess of 80%. So it's a big downward revision, but still within the context of everybody else, to see Ghana having growth really promising. I want to come back to, to Guyana in a few, but I'm a bit surprised that the IMF has decided to, well, has indicated that they're revising their growth projections on the positive side, given that we now have news coming out of the United States and Europe that the second wave basically is here, and also the news about you know, the two major companies halting their drug trials, their COVID-19 vaccine trials, Johnson & Johnson being one of the big ones. So right. that's, that's negative news. So two, bi two big pieces of negative news, yet the revision is on the positive side. What do you make of that, Auric? Well, it, it, it really comes down to the data that they would have gathered and, and compiled. Um, obviously, I don't have that on, on right now, but based on projections, um, they're pretty much, probably pretty much in line with what they have. So I really can't comment much on, on from that perspective. Mm. Jodian? I mean, well, the revision is really based on the, their... When they had done the initial projection, they had expected a worse off situation for quarter two and seeing that they have now seen actual outturn for quarter two to be better than what they had anticipated. That really led to the revision towards a much more positive outlook, I would say. But I mean, it, it's still a projection and they're still basing on the fact that at that point it would have been, I think, probably at the end of September because it was released in October. So, I mean, some of the news that we now have about you know, the trials not happening would possibly not have been factored in this. And right. I mean, this is still just your baseline projection. And if you dig deeper, then you, there are still risks that were there that could have it going further than what it is that they projected. But on the baseline projections, they're saying that it's a little bit better outlook than they had initially thought. Right. And you mentioned hurricane season earlier. Thank goodness it's almost over. We're on the last of it. <laughs> Usually the most active right. period is August to... August and September and somewhat in October as well. So we're, right. we're coming down, just cross our fingers that we dodge it this year because we can't manage, we can't manage a big hurricane this definitely, year. Definitely. <laughs> but you mentioned Guyana and some other the news coming out, of, a bit of news coming out of Guyana or coming out of Jamaica about Guyana is Supreme Ventures heading there. So what impact does that have? Does that give you 
is, is that an indication of confidence about Guyana now that we finally have an election result and so on? Right. They would have stalled some of the plans that Supreme Ventures had. I mean, I think it caused a bit of a delay. So they would have hoped that they would have been a bit further ahead in their build out in Guyana at this point. However, because of COVID as well as the issues with the election, it was stalled. And so it, it's not happening as fast as they would have hoped or projected, but it's still it's still promising. I mean, the Guyana operations is not as big as, you know, overall for Supreme Ventures. So it's not going to be that, you know, greatness in Guyana is going to know you know, undo all that's happened here in terms of local horse racing. However, it is still it's still promising, particularly when it is that companies are moving towards new markets and expanding. So it is really good news, particularly for, for Supreme Ventures to see that sort of move because with such an industry, because it's really based on the oil fine and with such a, a move, you know that there's going to be jobs and build out in Guyana's economy and that will release, you know, more disposable income. So it's good news. If they don't suffer from the oil curse that many countries have suffered right, from. Right. Oh boy. Well, Oryx, speaking of Supreme Ventures, they're heading to South Africa. How big a deal is that? That's very big actually. And it's good to see that they're, they're expanding their reach. Um, I think the company has significant growth potential, um, to be honest. You would have seen um, that they, they've been increasing their revenue through different um, um, mediums and try to grow different segments of the business. So I think that's a good way to bring value to shareholders over the long term. Um, so I'm definitely looking into that one. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your analysis as usual. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Take care. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, was brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel, and share with a friend. Also, subscribe to our newsletter at takingstock-ja.com and turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see all of my videos. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. This week on Money Mondays JA, we're looking at understanding and managing your credit card. On Money Moves JA, how to handle a dispute with a co-worker or employee. And on What's In It For Me, did you know you can appeal your taxes if you think they've overcharged you? We're talking everything from income tax to customs duties, so stay tuned. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kalila Ray and follow at TakingStockJA on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. Now, to that announcement. Dun, 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 dun. The wait is almost over. Our websites, kalilareynolds.com and takingstock-ja.com will be launched next Monday, October 26 at 7, 10 p.m., right after the premiere of Money Mondays JA. I'm doing a virtual event streaming at kalilareynolds.com. I have a ton of stuff to give away. I've got electronics, jewelry, gift certificates, and of course, money. I'll be giving you the full tour of my websites. So you'll get to meet some of my team members and be the first to snack my newest merch. The money masks are here. And not only do they look pretty cool, they're comfy too. So see you on Monday, October 26 at 7, 10 p.m. right after the premiere of Money Mondays JA for the live launch over at kalilareynolds.com. Now tell a friend about taking stock because investing is the new sexy. So let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Stay safe.